invite David to come up. Um, and as he is, I'll just briefly remind you uh, of David's long-standing uh, commitment to the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club. He is a former club chairman from 2008 to 11. He was also a council member uh, for a very long time, from 2004 to 16. And he's spoken to the club on numerous occasions, uh, 2003, 2006, 2009, 2012, 2011, <laughs> 2018, 2020. And because he didn't feel that was quite enough, he's here to speak to us again today. Uh, so David, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. So Chairman, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure to be here at the, the new club and to speak about uh, Red Gauntlet. Um, I'm very conscious of heavy drumming coming from outside. There appears to be a military parade of some sort going on, but it uh, presumably is not the Jacobites uh, returning for a final throw. Um, this, I thought we would begin with this image here, um, which is that of 1824, uh, Sir Edward Landseer the image being in the National uh, uh, Gallery in, in London. And on the table in front of him, interestingly, is the Sword of Montrose, which is one of Scott's uh, great uh, antiquarian uh, assets. The Red Gauntlet itself, uh, and I'm going to give you, if I may, a sort of circular tour around the novel itself, uh, concentrating on some of the characters who appear within it and the geographical uh, backdrop in which it, it is set probably begun during the winter uh, uh, recess of the Court of Session in, in, in 1823, and just after the publication of St. Roland's Well. Scott's working here at, at Abbotsford, which is just approaching its apogee of, of acreage. It was up to 1,100 acres by this point, 1824, one year, of course, before the Great Crash, which is not going to determine uh, part of this talk uh, uh, today. Probably written here in the great study, which all of us have visited more than once at, at Abbotsford. Um, and, uh, but interestingly, <coughs> concealed, both from his professional and his personal friends. Uh, because uh, the publisher, uh, the young constable here, was deliberately told by Scott that he was working on a novel to be called The Witch. And not only him, but also his, uh, his partner, Robert Cadell, here. This is one of the first uh, photographs, by the way, ever taken in, in, uh, just in, at, the, at the same time uh, by Hill and Adamson, David Octavius Hill, of course, our first great artist in photography. That's Cadell at the back there, co a colleague of, uh, 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 of the publisher, Constable. They were told that a novel was coming to be called The Witch. They, they took the bait. Scott, of course, had frequently published novels with just the definite article followed by a title, The Pirate, The, the, uh, the Abbot, for example, The Antiquary. And they, they believed that he was working on the witch. He was not. It was a deliberate mislead. But also, for his personal friends, there was also a, a default. He told uh, Lady Louisa Stewart here, one of his great literary correspondents, that he was working actually on a novel of the Crusades. So this wasn't a deliberate mislead, as with Cottrell and Cadell. This was a gentle movement to one side, because he was, of course, thinking about the novel that would follow Red Gauntlet, the two of them being, of course, the betrothed and, uh, and the talisman. And that was concealed from Lady Louisa and from, uh, from, 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 from Daniel Terry here, Scott's great friend in London. So you see how determined he was to be in secret with this particular work. And I think probably it was because of the autobiographical nature of it. These were not just ordinary friends, Lady Louisa and uh, Dan Terry. They were part of the magic circle. They were two of those who had been apprised of the identity uh, of, of the author of Waverley. And so from the first months of 1824, down to, up to Edinburgh, from Abbotsford, came the blue shirt. This is the great coach which carried Scott's manuscripts up to Edinburgh uh, for transcription and then ultimately uh, for, for publication. Now, the location of um, uh, the, the home, which you, we know it to as have been in George Square, Scott's own home, uh, and of course Brown Square. I love this image. This is 100 years ago this year. This is 1924, and you can see clearly the, the meadows and the Brunsfield links beyond it. And just above it, you can see George Square. Now, George Square, of course, become Brown Square uh, for the purpose of Red Gauntlet. Uh, 
And of course, there was a Brown Square, but it was, of course, also George Square, which we shall see in a moment. And this was a real find from the National Archive. This is the Scott home here on the right, on the western fringe, the western range of George Square, number 25, which was bought by Walter Scott Sr., lawyer, of course, at WS in Edinburgh. And you're now looking south towards the meadows. And on the left, the buildings you can see long gone are now the site of our main library of the University of Edinburgh. The western range of the square being one of the two, one and a half sides of the square, which had escaped being vandalized, as my colleagues put it, by the University of Edinburgh. And here is Walter Scott Sr., who of course is Saunders Fairford uh, in the book, a very clear image of Scott's uh, father. He was, of course, a Calvinist, Church of Scotland, although Scott did not follow him into that particular uh, area of, of, uh, uh, of religious uh, adherence. And what here, of course, this is the great painting of uh, uh, by Sir David Wilkie and others of Parliament Square as it was one individual which I can point out because of the, the lack of clarity on the image one in one of the individuals specified in this great painting is the, liti the vexatious lit litigant the vexatious litigant who of course appears as Peter Peebles uh, in, in Red Orchard itself oh, wait, David. Mm -hmm. Excellent. David. I'm not advanced. Over there. Point it that way. Point it in the I am pointing it over. Oh, yeah. All right, Parliament Square. And this is where Scott, of course, began his, uh, his career in, in the law. I don't have any image in my little collection of the gowned and, uh, uh, and bewigged uh, Walter Scott advocate, which he achieved being called to the bar in 1792. So I have to make settled for this other writer. You may recognize, of course, another great writer of Edinburgh, who we rarely see in his advocate's uh, gown and wig. This is, of course, Robert Louis Stevenson, who compromised with his father, who wanted him to be an engineer and build lighthouses, with, with RLS himself, who wanted to be a, a writer, and indeed, of course, uh, did become so. But down in the borders, where part of uh, Ordinary Gauntlet is, of course, set down in Dupreece and Galloway, to be more precise, in today's geography. And there's a very important guy in this, in this image here. This is Charles Martin Hardy's famous painting of Robert Burns standing on the left here, talking to the young apprentice Walter Scott, working in his father's law office. And he's been pushed forward to speak to Burns, as we know from, uh, from contemporary accounts. Uh, by young Adam Ferguson, Scott's lifelong friend. And, and on the far left is his father. Uh, he plays a role in Red Gauntlet's uh, uh, genesis, of course. This is uh, Professor uh, Ferguson, who one of the founders of the discipline of sociology with his great work, The Nature of Civil Society. Interestingly, in this group, showing the upper echelon of Edinburgh society of the time um, is uh, Adam Smith, no less the author of An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of, of the Wealth of Nations. By the way, you can see that, uh, that uh, uh, Professor Ferguson Sr. is poking the fire. Well, he might. It was the coldest house in Edinburgh, <laughs> and known to his friends and colleagues as Kamchatka, uh, to the great uh, uh, Siberian Peninsula. Uh, that's right. <coughs> So down after, his, after he left um, Edinburgh, he lived here at Holyard's house in the borders, where young Scott and Adam Ferguson Jr. and John Scott, Walter's brother, came to visit him in their famous visit to the borders, to Dumfries, <coughs> Galloway, and over the border into Cumberland in, in 79. This is Holyard's house in, in the Manor Valley. And that's uh, very interesting to my family because the Ferdy family originated here and across the hill behind it at Troquare. And in fact, uh, Tom Purdy, later to work for Scott as his factotum and, and uh, grieve on the Abbotsford estate, uh, came from that area himself. And this is the home of one of the, ma of the man who brought him across the border on that remarkable occasion. Uh, this is the, the home of Charles Kerr of Abertrull House. Uh, not far from, from uh, Hoyk, in the borders, long demolished, sadly. But the man who was part of the formation of Darcy Latimer, 
was the man from here. I think it was mostly Charles Kerr of Abertrude who formed the image of, uh, of Darcy. I'm sorry, Lee, I'm still having difficulty getting the, getting the slides to advance, but it seems to be working reasonably well. And of course, down in the borders, uh, Scott was collecting by this time material for what would be his first really successful work, The Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border, uh, dedicated to, to, to the, the Duke of Buccleuch, uh, uh, Charles, uh, sorry, Henry, third Duke of Buccleuch, to whom Scott was indebted for his patronage in acquiring the uh, Sheriffdom of Surrey. And down in the borders, too, it's important that Scott writes in two languages in Red Lock. We have English and we have Scots. And for our overseas guests today, can I just reiterate something which is unique to all of us here, and that is the Scots language, the low, Lowland Scots language, is not, repeat, not a dialect of English. It is a true <laughs> language in its own right and recognized as such by the European Union. Scott learned it down here, spending quite a bit of his childhood at Sandy Now Farm, his grandfather's farm in the borders uh, uh, near Kelso. Interestingly, in the borders, he was a great admirer, Scott, of, of uh, the poet Burns. He did not come to the funeral of Burns, slightly before their visit to the borders that I've just mentioned. This is the funeral of our national bard, Indum Fries, in July 1796. For some reason, reasons we're not entirely clear about, despite uh, Scott praising Burns and his, uh, and, and, and his legacy, uh, Eric, Eric Anderson here, the editor, superb editor of Scott's journal, uh, makes a particular point of recalling how Scott writes, Peace to thy soul and long life to thy fame, Rob Burns. If I need a phrase about something about which I feel strongly, I find that phrase in Shakespeare or in thee. But down in the borders with his friends, with young Adam Ferguson, his brother John, uh, and uh, Charles Kerr, um, of, of Abertrue, this is where the meeting took place. This is Gillsland, 12, mile, 12 miles east of Carlisle, over in border in Cumberland, very close to Hadrian's Wall, uh, where they were on holiday and where he met a certain lady, Charlotte Charpentier, who would later become Mrs. Scott and later, of course, Lady Scott. And here in St. Mary's Kirk in, in uh, Carlisle, this is the, 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 the this is the rail, as it's called, in this church, High Church of England church. <coughs> Scott and Charlotte were were, were married. Uh, at the same time, he was receiving a lot of information from from this man, uh, from from Joseph Train, an antiquary, and a colleague actually of Burns at the Excise Office in Dumfries. He was of immense value to Scott by telling him the stories of the borders himself being an excise officer at some times. This is Cripple in the background, smuggling brick here on the Solway, and Scott was a great expert by this time on what was going on along the coastline of De Vries and Galloway, and the interactions between the smugglers, which were rife at the time, and, and the revenue men. This is Robert Burns' own weapon. I used, to this, I used to think this was a musket until my soldier son, Homan Lee from the army, said, Daddy, that's not a musket, that's a carbine. A carbine is a handheld cannon used by the revenue men who appear in, in uh, Red Gauntlet uh, in their confrontations, often extremely bloody, with the smugglers. The smugglers being full of fight, knowing what would happen to them if they were caught, and heavily armed. Another connection with uh, Red Gauntlet was uh, giving a talk at Gatehouse of Fleet recently. This is the the kirk at Twinehall, down in the Fries and Galloway. And in, in that kirkyard lies this guy. This, this is the tombstone of the man um, who became Wandering Willie Steenson. This is, a, he was Welsh. Uh, his name was, was Pritchard. And he was coming home from gigs in Ireland, passing through Twinehall, when there was a major accident. He was sheltering in a sand pit or a sand cavern which collapsed upon him, his wife Helen, who was a harpist, and their children. They were all killed. And this is the memorial to, to young Pritchard. And uh, he was blind, by the way, just as Wandering Willie was. He was blind from military service in Egypt, probably from Bilhartia, uh, which was rife among our troops under General Abercrombie uh, at that time. 
There are also very interesting in the, in the, uh, in the Red Gauntlet uh, uh, Dramatis Persona is this lady. We don't know everything about her even yet. Um, this is one. Uh, this is the wife, or formerly the mistress, of, of, of Charles Edward Stuart. Um, she was born in Stirlingshire, and this house, and this house here, which is Bannockburn House, the home of her cousins and her uncles, uh, in Stirlingshire, of course, not far from the great battlefield of Bannockburn. Uh, and she became the mistress for eight years of Charles Edward Stuart in the 18 in 1750s. No longer Bonnie, as you can see, this painting by Hugh, uh, Hugh Douglas Hamilton is in the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, just a few yards away from up in, uh, uh, in Queen Street. And this is her daughter Charlotte, who became the, uh, the, the uh, nurse and the accompanist, uh, accompaniment to Charles Edward Stuart, her father, for the last four years of his life. She then died one year after him in 1789, same year as the, as the revolution. And I, I mentioned to my neighbor just earlier that there is still a Jacobite connection. This is the present head of the Jacobite faction. This is, would you believe, Bonaventure. This is Franz Bonaventure Herzog von Bayern, the Duke of Bavaria. And if you go online to the Royal Stuart website, you will find that he is regarded as the present claimant to the throne. This is a delightful aristocrat, a man of great scholarship and intellectual power, and who sent a lovely letter to our king, to King Charles III, the second King Charles III, remember, because after his father's death, Charles Edward Stuart uh, designed himself, or called himself Charles III, uh, briefly. He sent a letter to our king congratulating him on his accession uh, to the throne. One other uh, individual I want to mention before the end is uh, this guy. This is the this is the sheriff courtroom at Selkirk. Scott, remember, was an advocate, sheriff of Selkirkshire, principal clerk of session, uh, and in court one day he faced up to a man in the dock, who was in fact the model for uh, for for, for uh, uh, Crystal Crystal Nix. If you look at the description of Crystal Nix, it is. It is Tom Purdy to the life. I'm sure Tom was not impressed to find that Crystal Nixon turned out to be a traitor. <laughs> oh. that's, that's my klaxon. My, my time in uniform being spent at sea. That's the klaxon. <laughs> it means action stations, mind dead ahead or enemy in sight. And allows me four minutes to finish these remarks. <laughs> 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 Very proud of this guy. He was a delightful uh, asset for Scott at uh, at Aberystwyth in, in many in many formats. And just let me finish by, by looking once at the uh, 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 oh sorry can I go back to, to that the court the court of session our jurists here today will, will recognise of course the court Scott's command of Scots and English comes out all the way through Randolph. <coughs> he is utterly fluent in Scots and in English, having learned the Scots language as I did in the borders from, uh, from my relatives in farming. And I think there's a delightful uh, uh, story about that. His lordship on the bench during a case in the court of session um, was having great difficulty understanding what was being led in evidence by an old borders sheep farmer from Kelso or from Jedburgh, deep in the borders. The old boy did not speak English, he spoke Scots, complete with powerful Boros dialect and diction, leaving his lordship seriously at, fee, at, uh, at sea. But you could see his, where help might come from. Down in the well of the court on that particular day was the principal clerk of session in Wigan Gown, Walter Scott, one of the country's greatest authorities on the Boros dialect. So apparently his lordship uh, called Mr. Scott, kindly approached the bench, said, Mr. Scott, put this question to this witness. Does he believe that the defender in this case is a man of probity? If he is an upright, honest person, a man of probity, put this kindly to, to the witness. Scott went over to the witness stand and said to the old farmer, His lordship is Spiranoia anent the defender yonder. Would you hold the creator to be otherwise loveable? <laughs> and the witness said, Hen, I wouldn't have loved him with a bolster. <laughs> Scott went back to the bench and said, uh, no, my lord. <laughs> and just finally, on 1824, 
one of Scott's great friends and colleagues, but not a, not a friend politically. They were personal friends and colleagues, of course. This is Lord Coburn. And Lord Coburn and Walter Scott, in 1824, around the time of Red Gauntlet, came up with an idea. They needed a new school. They were not happy, both of them, with the quality of Latin and Greek <laughs> being, being uh, taught at their old school, the High School of Edinburgh, and the result was the Edinburgh Academy. <coughs> and and I, had, I was able to find, when I was giving a talk on speech day at the Academy some years ago, the text of Walter Scott's address, because he was invited by Coburn, by Lord Coburn, to give the address on that first morning of the school to the 300 boys at the intake. And just one sentence from it will suffice and show Scott's eloquence on his feet. He said, you are not here, said he to the boys, you are not here to be taught. You are here to be educated. You are here to be furnished with the knowledge and the skills and the attitudes which, in addition to your own character, will allow you to excel in whatever field of endeavor you choose to exert yourselves. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for keeping to time and also for competing with the uh, background drums. Uh, Inspiration. Well, that was a very, very useful uh, context setting of both Scott's time and, and the connections directly with Red Gold. But again, we have time for a brief question or comment if there is one. Edward? What was the autobiographical element in Red Gauntlet which led him to want to keep its genesis a secret? It was the very fact that it was autobiographical. He was dealing within the family. He was talking about his father and, and the, his childhood in, uh, in, in George Square. And some, I think I forgot to mention that it was only very recently I discovered that George Square was Brown Square. Did you know that uh, a property developer bought that land? His name was James Brown and put up the, the houses around the square, one of which was published by Scott Senior. Because Sir George Square actually is Brown Square. And, and one thing I also should have mentioned about that autobiographical presence was that the, uh, on the western range of the square, which you saw, that is where the teacup landed. A teacup landed out of the window, thrown by Scott Senior, of all people, because it had touched the lips of Stuart of Broughton who had turned King's evidence. Yes, and, and such was the moral probity of Scott Senior, a man of, of distinct uh, 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 moral rectitude, a fine man, that he would not have it in the house. Scott kept the saucer. It's at Abbotsford now. <laughs> yeah. so, so it was, he wanted it in the fact, he didn't want anyone to know what he was doing for that, these few months over the winter of 23-24. Uh, of, uh, Thank you. Sir. Um, just one back row, uh, note of approbation of the um, importance of the, um, the southwest from which some of us come. In Annandale, where I was breaking for books in, in a fortnight ago, I've got this wonderful book, Exploring the Solway. And the interesting thing about it is it's quintessentially we're talking about debatable lands, where you have one culture and another, yeah. only two miles across the water from Annan. And um, I shall place the book which refers to, in fact, a bit of the um, Solway Fir, which is, in fact, the line where the yeah. airship got caught by the tide. We'll live that language in this story mostly, and yeah. um, for Anne and Neil and Priest. You're dead right. The, the debatable land is a major part of our history and that of our dear friends and neighbours south of Hadrian's Wall. Uh, the uh, debatable land belonged to both sides until it was settled, finally, uh, by Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth told her Secretary of State, go up to Scotland and tell King Jamie to sort out the border. There was no doubt in Queen Elizabeth's mind, we now know, that James VI of Scotland would be her successor. But it had to, he had to pacify the border first. The debatable land then coalesced around what is the border today, the, as you know, the, the River Tweed at its eastern, uh, eastern end. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, sorry, one final thing. Uh, Scott's ancestors themselves knew the debatable land very well. Old Watt of Harden, the, the Scots of Harden, they were much involved, as were my own ancestors, uh, right through the Middle Ages in what we might call diplomatically 
the cross-border livestock transportation industry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. So moving on to our next speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome Ian up to the podium. Uh, Ian's well known.